Welcome to Collected Talks of David Solomon, podcasts on Jewish history, the Bible, Jewish mysticism, philosophy, and thought. Find out more about David's upcoming classes, publications, and other recorded lectures by visiting davidsolomon.online. And now, here's the lecture. Hello, I'm David Solomon. I want to take a moment before this lecture begins to make a few short announcements. First, I'd like to flag that the lecture you are about to hear is episode 50 of the podcast, an exciting milestone that has crept up on us quickly. It is also now a year since the first episode of this podcast was released. I want to thank you, the people listening, for joining us on this exciting educational journey and to invite you to stay with us for another year's worth of talks. I would also like to take a moment to thank the people who are supporting this podcast through Patreon and other channels. Your contributions are greatly appreciated. They go directly towards covering the cost of producing and hosting these podcasts. I'm also keen to thank uh, the people who are making this podcast possible, from Malky, who does our intros, to Dimitri, who does the occasional cameo announcement and helps with some of our video editing, and to Adina, who recently joined the podcast editing team. And finally, I'd like to thank Marjorie for putting this all together, the podcast, the website, the social media and newsletter. I give the talks, but this amazing team does everything else. We are marking episode 50 with a lecture taken from a Jewish history series I gave a few years ago, of which I was particularly proud, a series on women in Jewish history. Unfortunately, not all of those talks were successfully recorded, but this lecture, episode 50, and the one to follow, episode 51, are the two final talks in that series. If we manage to salvage more, we will include them as future episodes. So enough from me. Thank you once again for joining us. And now, here's the talk. Obviously, I have a lot to talk about today. I'm going to put a timeline on the board, uh, a little bit of a timeline, called, just so that we can orient ourselves, because I'm covering really parts of four centuries. Because we're uh, dealing with more recent history, I don't have to really use the map too much. Already, in fact, the map that really I'd have to show you for this period would be a map of the globe because we're starting to get a global feel now in historical terms once we get past 1750, 1800. And it's only a couple of centuries ago, it's not a long time ago, but by the middle of the 18th and the early 19th, we already had a sense of what the world looked like and how big it was and there might have been a lot of things we didn't know about it. And Jewish history is being played out in all different parts of it. But the first woman I want to just talk about uh, today uh, really is a kind of a little bit of an extension of, look, all, all of the women I'm going to talk about today are remarkable. You have to understand, if I edit it down to 10 or so women over the last couple of hundred years, they have to be extraordinary. And some are extraordinary and remarkable because they're also a little bit weird. And last week, if you recall, I, when briefly discussing the 17th century, I talked about the role of women in the Sabbatean movement. Yes. And how interestingly enough, for all of its antinomian tendencies, antinomian means naughty, for all of its antinomian tendencies, they did give a whole new meaning and status to the role of women, especially spiritually and cosmically. Now, those of you who are familiar with the history of the Sabbatean movement will know that the Sabbatean movement did not die out with the conversion of Shabtai Tzvi to Islam. It, of course, carried on for a long time after. In fact, many decades, there was a huge expectation of more Sabbatean revivals. Shabtai Tzvi was going to return, as I've said on numerous occasions. We've never had a Messiah whose followers didn't believe after his death that he wasn't coming back. That seems to be a very, very familiar pattern, so it was Shabtai Tzvi. And there were, in fact, quite a number of pretenders to that particular situation. People popping up going, oh, I'm the reincarnation of Shabtai Tzvi, I'm the return of the Messiah. And they caused all sorts of different levels of mischief, but 
the one that really, really blew the gasket of everybody in Europe actually happened around about a hundred years after Shabtai Tzvi, and one of the naughtiest boys of Jewish history, who in the middle of the 18th century, so around about the 1750s, 1760s, popped up. A guy called Jacob Frank pops up and says, not only am I a revelation of Shabtai Tzvi, not only are we buying into the whole Sabbatean project. These are major cults, by the way. These are not stupid ideas locked away in a corner from people that had these ideas before they invented lithium as a medication. These are major players in affecting, certainly European and even within the Ottoman Empire, Jewry and these are major cults with thousands of adherents in some cases tens of thousands, Jacob Frank said, not only am I a return of Shabtai Tzvi, with theologies backing them up, I am also a manifestation of every Messiah, and especially you know who. Yes, and in fact I am really an incarnation, a full-blown revealed incarnation of the patriarch Jacob, I've been here before as Jesus, I've been here before as Shabtai Tzvi, and I'm here now. Now that, uh, that's one thing, and so we go, okay, Jacob, that's fine, and he goes around, and Jacob Frank is a fascinating subject, There's people make a lot of study of it, you can look into Frankism, it's a huge phenomenon in Jewish history in the middle of the 18th century. What's not as well known, it's known by those who study Frankist history, but what's not as well known is just the centrality of Frank's ideas regarding women. And one of the major, major things that was happening within the... I mean, by the end of the, 90, the 1750s, Frank had taken hundreds of families into Christianity. They felt, the cult felt, that the best way to protect their rights and their religious freedoms was, in fact, to convert to Christianity. They would have the protection of the church, but they'd be able to carry on as they were. Oh, he was in Poland and Germany, predominantly. Well, mostly Poland. Massive fights with rabbis, huge debates. Once they had church backing, the church was a little freaked out by Frank, but it let it go. They ennobled Frank. They gave him a, a royal, kind of a quasi-noble, baronic status. He was living in a castle. He was a dude. He was wandering around. And many Jews across Europe regarded him as their spiritual leader. This is at a time where in other parts of Eastern Europe, the whole concept of the Hasidic Rebbe was coming to the fore as well. Frank, what did sorry, what did <laughs> excellent question, and there are different views on that. Um, the likelihood is, is that he probably picked up a lot of Zoharic and Kabbalistic uh, expressions and literature along the way, but he was predominantly unlearned, certainly started out that way. In contrast to Shabtai Tzvi of a century earlier, who was an extremely learned individual. Frank started a commune for his followers, or these followers that went with him into the church, and this commune, ahead of its time, I might add, some may not necessarily think this is an ideal situation, but certainly ahead of its time, believed in the concept of free love. And free love meant free love. It meant a breakdown of traditional structures in society that govern sexual relations. So this, this was a major, major point about the Frankist cult, and they, they, they defined this theologically as well. And when I say a breakdown of the social structures that govern sexual relations between people, that includes incest. Now, Frank also developed an entire theology. I've got to be careful because I could spend the entire hour talking about Frank and we have so many people to talk about. But in short, the person that I want you to be aware of, Frank has an entire theological development within his system that is actually going to go and become in some ways more influential in, in some ways than and outlives and becomes more influential than the Frankist movement itself. And that is the idea that ultimately the Messiah is a woman. Mm 
and because the effective uh, task of our generation is to raise the feminine up to the level of the male and beyond and to raise her higher above the male so ultimately who is going to be the messiah a woman called identified by the Frankist movement as the messiah is a woman that we know as Eve Frank who of course was Frank's daughter uh, Frank claimed that she was in fact uh, the illegitimate daughter of Catherine the, uh, the second of Catherine the Great but we're not really uh, going to buy that one he certainly spread that rumour we're fairly certain who her mother was it was Frank's uh, first wife yes Yes, that was, that was at first, and then as the movement, he developed. It, 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 it evolved in Frank's thought once his daughter started growing up. His daughter was a very, very charismatic and talented young girl. She was about six when her father and his followers converted to Christianity. Her original name, I think, was Rebecca. She took the name Eve or Eva uh, on her conversion to Christianity as a child, but grew up not really as a Christian and not really as a Jew, but as a Frankist. And uh, by the time Frank, Frank dies in around 1791, and by that time, Frank was already talking about her not only succeeding in the movement, but becoming the Messiah. This was a development over time. When Frank started his whole I'm the Messiah movement, he didn't even have a daughter. All right. uh, obviously, at the time and beyond throughout history, people have very easily brought into the um, historical rumour that within the commune, uh, and it would make sense, because Frank was completely out of control, that in fact uh, a, a Jacob Frank and his daughter were uh, lovers and sharing more than simply a familial relationship. Uh, that, is, that is something that the mind recoils at and you don't want to think about it, but the historical circumstances point uh, reasonably strongly in that direction but we can't know for sure if that is what was happening what we do know is that after Frank's death Eve Frank continued to drive the movement forward and at some point her followers and crypto followers because there are many crypto Frankists uh, are numbering across Europe in the many many thousands and she was seen so she uh, never married and she was seen as a virginal figure she herself said I'm now a, an incarnation of the Virgin Mary so she was attracting that whole Judaic Christian synthesis I'm fully aware that we are looking at this like it's Lala but these were strong ideas at the time that were very very seductive and people that were looking for new ways of spiritual expression outside of traditional religion she dies in around 1816 I think 1817 but not I mean uh, she was recognised as a noble woman by many of the kings of Europe who thought that her philosophy or religion was a bit weird, but the Frankists were a recognised cult. She was regarded, she's the only person really in Jewish history who is fully regarded by a large group of people as a female messiah. She didn't fix the world, it would appear, from the perspective of a couple of centuries later. No. The regular Jew was nothing but appalled by the Frankist movement. But we're talking about women in Jewish history, and Frankism is definitely a part of Jewish history. It's not studied outside in any other discipline that I'm aware of, but it is studied within Jewish history. And Eve Frank is a central figure. But I'm moving on from Eve Frank. I just needed to point her out. Uh, those of you who find that subject interesting are welcome to go There's a l into it. There's a lot more to Eve Frank than I've discussed uh, just now. I've just talked about basically the highlights. There's some very, very weird stuff. There were people that were paying pilgrimages constantly in the first couple of decades of the 19th century to this woman uh, living in various places uh, throughout Europe, seen as this holy woman. The, the movement went into rapid decline after her, after her death, primarily because she and her father were very, very good at collecting donations and attracting the kind of money you would need to run a movement and a commune and so on. All right. Don't, don't, get, don't distract me to Frank. I seriously can go deeper to Frankism and I don't want to go there. We've talked about Eve Frank. And, but at the same time that that's happening, that Eve Frank is being Eve Frank, there's something else happening in a totally different mode of Jewish society. 
in a not too far away. I'm going to shift to Germany now and I'm going to talk about a very, very little understood and only slightly known phenomenon that was happening in the end of the, the 18th century, so the end of the 1700s in Berlin. And many people, when they come across this, go, how come we don't know about this? And it's uh, really, really a remarkable episode uh, if we're talking about women in Jewish history. And I have to touch upon it uh, a bit because I have, before the break, I have several very, very important women that I want to discuss. But I need to talk about uh, this phenomenon. And it involves not just one woman, it involves several women. And I don't know how familiar we are, so we just, I'll just give the basic context. Uh, Berlin, uh, the end of the 18th century, so the end of the 1700s, Berlin is really a hotbed of intellectual and philosophical effervescence. I mean, Berlin always is. Berlin is one of those cities that in waves, every few decades, will really see a manifestation of, of culture geist and be a very creative place. And at the end of the 18th century, so before, before the Napoleonic Wars kicked the guts out of Prussia and other German kingdoms, Berlin was really bubbling. And what we're seeing, there, what we're seeing at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th, as I'm sure those of you who are familiar with the development of ideas would be aware, is what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing the kind of We've had the kind of high stages of uh, the Enlightenment and the, and, and the age of reason, as it came to be known, uh, which really characterizes the 18th century. And we've talked about that before in the height of the 18th century. And the French really had a handle on that. So did the English and so did the Germans. But especially in Europe, especially in Germany, by the end of the 18th, we're seeing a kind of a reaction to that, which we now know as... What movement in thought kind of reacts a bit to the age of reason? When I say it, you'll go, oh, oh, yeah, fine. The romantic movement. And romanticism is an entire field of thought in human culture that is kind of a little bit reacting against rationality. It's getting more back to nature, more back to emotions, not just the plain word of the meaning of the word romance, the romantic idea uh, about ideals and specifically to do with the nature of human beings rather than necessarily this concept of the rational intellect. Uh, it's, it, it spawns a huge range of poets and writers and artists and even political theories. I mean, if you think about it, Napoleon himself, with the whole idea of the nation state, is really a, a love child of, of romanticism. And so you've got this romantic effervescence happening in Berlin at the end of the 18th century, and you have the highly developed institution of the Salon. Now, some of you are familiar with the concept of the Salon. And that's a concept really that kind of uh, comes out of France and then makes its way in different directions in Europe. But the Salon, the literary Salon, as a place, I mean, in Germany, it was probably much more organized and structured and, and uh, the, disciplined than it would necessarily have been in France. But they put on tremendous uh, displays of, you know, uh, readings and performances and discussion groups. They are really, really where culture is happening and some of the salons are extremely trendy and it's not so easy just to get into the salon. They start becoming exclusive because it's who you know and there's a huge intellectual elite that is rising up within Germany at the end of the 18th century. What lit is little known is the fact that the major salons in Berlin were run by Jewish women. They set them up, they ran them not as, not as, you know, domestic catering managers, or oh, you, you talk, I'll make the kiddish, right? <laughs> but as the full participants and main drive of the whole literary and artistic projects of the salon. 
Now, there are a number of women. Remember, remember, this also is an environment. I, if, you, if you don't understand this particular contextual point, you can't get there. This is a Berlin that has been, in, in terms of Jewish life, has been deeply influenced by the presence during the last few decades of one of the greatest Jewish figures of the 18th century, Moses Mendelssohn, who has seriously imprinted his influence on that city and its relation to Jews and Jews themselves and their relationship to the outside world and the outside culture. And so it's also, as well as a literary effervescence, in Berlin generally, there is a movement on the part of Jews to assimilate. Assimilation, in, listen carefully, assimilation in 18th century Germany, at the end of the 18th century, the word assimilation was not a dirty word. It was in fact regarded by many people as a cultural imperative for Jews. Not assimilation as we measure it today. When we talk about assimilation today, we have one yardstick. That is, did he or she marry out or did they not? Assimilation in the 18th century was cultural assimilation. You were still expected to remain married to a Jew. In fact, it was very difficult not to marry Jews because most Christians still didn't want to marry Jews unless Jews converted. Now, of these women, and I obviously time constraints only to discuss uh, two or three of them, but if there's one that you would need to know to look into greater detail about her life, because she was also uh, a very, very respected writer. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, no, 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 no. Who's heard of this person? This is why I need to discuss this, because this is such an amazing... Uh, episode in, in Jewish history and in women's history. This, her name is Rachel Varnhagen. She's immense. And in fact, we're going to come back to Rachel Varnhagen a little later when we talk about someone else. But Rachel Varnhagen's life is really a kind of a classic picture of this and she was born into a Jewish family in Berlin. Her family wasn't as orthodox as some of the others. They were already making uh, assimilationist moves but she is part of a kind of middle class cultured Jewish German families that are living under the influence of Mendelssohn that believe in an equality of education for girls. Maybe not equality as we would understand it today, but that girls should be given the opportunity to be educated. But Rachel, and like, remember like what we saw at the end of the uh, 16th century in Italy, in Venice and so on, Berlin was uh, a couple of centuries uh, later, was a very, very similar movement amongst women to get involved at the highest levels of uh, culture and literature and so on. Uh, Van Hagen eventually, like all of the other women that I'll mention in this period, pretty much bar none, at some point in their life convert to Christianity. In some cases it is after uh, the death of their parents when they feel that they are no longer bound by culture and they're able to fully integrate Christianity. They had, very few of them were converting for theological reasons, I believe, maybe in a couple of cases. Most of them were, as so many German Jews who converted to Christianity of that echelon, were doing it really out of cultural, uh, it really didn't mean that much, but it was a cult, outward cultural type of ad adjustment that one made. Most of these women that's a, they're fascinating women. At, at some point, they divorced their husbands that their family had set them up with and then married off to... Uh, I mean, for example, she was very good friends, Dorothea Mendelssohn. And those of you who want to go into the history of the Mendelssohn daughters, they are fascinating. Dorothea had a scandalous affair uh, that really rocked Berlin society with the writer Schlegel, but they stayed together. She was married at the time, met him in the Salon, etc. So the Salons got this reputation not only as places of high culture, but also as places uh, where, uh, not immorality, but culture, it was culturally dangerous. Yeah. Yes, very quickly, Judith. Uh, 
Thank you. Thanks. Sometimes I get a question that is so right on where I'm about to talk about that it's just beautifully timed. So I'm going to answer that in a roundabout way. Of course there's anti-Semitism. It's number one, we're at the 1700s. Number two, we are in uh, Germany. So there is, of course, anti-Semitism, which all of these people need to confront at some point. What is super fascinating about um, Van Hagen is that she is very, very well known in her writings and so on um, for her struggle with her Jewish identity. Some people, when they confront anti-Semitism or the, the concept of being a Jew in society, it uh, propels them uh, to an even greater expression of their Jewishness. And some people recoil against the way society looks at them and tries, try, they try to find other, other values. Van Hagen famously struggled to the day she died with her Jewish identity. She was, for want of a better term, for want of a better term, but this, this may be a little harsh, she was kind of ashamed of it. She kind of wished she hadn't been born a Jew because, as she writes, the pressure of being Jewish means you constantly have to excel and you constantly have to be impressive in order, not just because that's a Jewish value, but also in order to be accepted within wider society. It's something she could never, it was like a stain on her she could never quite get rid of. And then just as she died, uh, according to her husband who edited her letters for the next 20 years, she made a kind of a declaration as she was dying that it was kind of a summation of Jewish history. You know, I'm part of a people that came out of Egypt and went to Palestine and, and, and have been in exile and we have done this and we have done that. And I realized that I have been uh, privileged to have been born into that and to be able to express something of the history of that people. And I now would not want it to have been any other way. It's a famous uh, statement that Van Hagen made. This is a woman living in the, uh, this is in the early 19th century already. Um, she, the other women, if you're interested in that entire uh, chapter in Jewish history, the other women to look at, I'm, I'm focusing on Van Hagen for a reason, but there's a woman called um, another, well, she was actually born into quite a religious family, Henrietta Hertz. Uh, Henrietta Hertz, uh, a similar kind of picture to Van Hagen, also grew up in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a culture, but in, got herself married, got herself educated. They were all friends, they all had certain friends amongst the glitterati of the, of the German uh, literary scene. The big one, the big one that they all wanted to be friends with, because if he was your friend, then your salon was, even if he never visited your salon, just the notion that you would be reading out personal letters from him to your salon in your salon was enough to guarantee your salon as one of the more frequented. Who would that giant of a German literature be that's hanging around at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century that would all, all want to be in connection Goethe. with? Who? Goethe. 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 Goethe, without question. What is amazing about that, and I, I, I've got to tell you this because this is this is it. There's another woman, another woman in that sect, in that kind of group, uh, is a fascinating one called Sarah Grotius. She also ran a salon in Berlin. Uh, many of these women found their fortunes very, very reversed after 1806 with the Napoleonic Wars. That really put the quasher on everything. But uh, Sarah Grotius, uh, when she was um, young, she was about 13, and she read uh, The Sorrows of Young Werther. The Sorrows of Young Werther was the first real kind of romantic novel that Goethe wrote. It became very, very popular. It still is kind of, in a way, popular. And Mendelssohn, who'd been hired by Sarah's teachers as kind of to have an influence and guidance over the girl's education, her and her sister's education, Mendelssohn saw Goethe's The Sorrow of Young Werther lying around in her room or in her hand. He snatched it and he threw it out the window. 
because Mendelssohn regarded Goethe as a bad influence on youth. Just to give you an idea, <laughs> you're living in a culture where Goethe is considered a bad influence on youth. Today, if we found a 13-year-old girl reading Goethe, we'd be taking her out of school and having her privately tutored. And <laughs> yeah, So it's a fascinating uh, thing how different generations remember that even Socrates, Socrates was accused of corrupting the youth of his generation. I mean, Socrates. So always be aware when you talk about here, people go, oh, that's corrupting the youth. So this is a fascinating episode, and uh, we could go into uh, more detail, uh, but I, I, I want to move on. I want to talk about someone because I need to be aware of time. Ooh. Ooh. I know what I wanted to get to before the break. So I don't... Now, this, the next person uh, that's kind of moving into the, 18th, into the 19th century, who's kind of born around about that 1805. So these women are really reaching their peak in the early 19th, like 1805, 1806. That's kind of the end of the glory period of the Salons of Berlin that are run by Jewish women. This person is born in a very different part of Europe, far more to the east, in a kind of a much more shtetly environment. And her name... <laughs> Her name is Hannah Rochel, or Rochel Hanna Webermacher. Who is familiar with that? She's otherwise known in Jewish history. A lot of people know her by her title and not by her name. Her name is Hannah Rochel Webermacher. She was born to a guy called Monish Webermacher. Uh, but we know her as the maid of Ludmir. Who is familiar with the maid of Ludmir? Very good. What is remarkable about the maid of Ludmir, just before I go into any aspect of her life, is that this is the only woman that became a fully recognized and classic Hasidic Rebbe. She ran her own Hasidic court and she had disciples and a kind of Hasidic movement that followed her. She is the only woman in that world that rose to that particular level. And her story is really quite incredible. By the time you get to the 19th century, and you're already in third or fourth generation of Hasidic leadership, it's very unlikely that you're going to become a Hasidic Rebbe unless your father was one. By then, it's already pretty much dynastic. We know that about the Hasidic movement. That the first couple of generations were not dynastic. They were simply comprised of outstanding spiritual individuals that automatically took leadership positions. The students of the Maggid of Mizrich and of the Baal Shem Tov and the Maggid of Mizrich and those generations. By the time you get here, it's already dynastic. And the structure of the Hasidic world, as we understand it, with the Rebbe's and the followers and so on, was already pretty much in place. And she was not born into a Rebbe's family. She was born into kind of like an ordinary, middle-class, working family. But she was precocious. They didn't have any sons. So they kind of didn't, they didn't encourage her to learn, but they didn't discourage her. There's a kind of a threefold structure here. There's encouragement, discouragement, and in between, we're not discouraging you. And they would allow her to sit around and watch her father learning the text that he was learning. There are different historical views on whether her father was or was not particularly learned. But even if he wasn't particularly learned, every observant Jewish man at that stage would be, as ideally now as well, would be spending some time of his day learning and studying texts, and she would be in the room, and she would be, she developed a fascination for 
not just the literature that women were definitely encouraged to read, we mentioned this last week, like the Tzenor Ena and the versions of the Bible in Yiddish and so on, but she actually pursued an interest in studying uh, Agada, Agadic works, Musar, Midrash, and many of the other genres of Jewish literature that are not normally uh, what women study. She also developed a bit of an interest in studying Talmud, but I don't think that was her main thing. She was also extremely interested in spiritual and Kabbalistic literature. When she was about 14, 15, she fell in love with one of the boys in the village, much to her father's horror, because he realised that he had quite a talented girl here, and for her to fall in love and have such erotic yearnings, as it was described, towards some, you know, just some Chaim Shmerel from the village, was highly discouraged, but she was very, very much involved in that, although obviously it, uh, it remained very chaste and she never eloped with him or anything like that. And then I'm fairly certain that around that time, a little bit after her mother died, and that kind of had a bit of a profound effect on her and so on. But her turning point really, and she was ill and she recovered from an illness, she had a difficult teenhood. She wasn't really adjusting to the traditional roles that uh, were placed on women in her situation. She wasn't really finding acceptance amongst her peers because she was a bit of a freak. She could read texts and she was very bright, but very kind of dreamy as well, spiritual. And at about the age of 17, 18, he collapsed. She had a collapse in um, the cemetery. And during her time in that collapsed state or during the convalescence as a result of it, she underwent some form of visionary experience, transformative visionary experience. And when she emerged from that, she decided that she knew who she was and that she was never destined to marry and that she was in fact going to be a tzaddik. She was going to devote her life to being a righteous, holy person. And that's what she did. And within a few years, people started hearing about this. And once you start becoming, getting a reputation for being a righteous, holy person who's dedicating your life to that, you also sometimes and usually acquire a reputation as being able to do the odd miracle or two and to give spiritual advice and spiritual counsel. And over time, she grew a sizable court. However, it was not, it did not go without notice that she was a woman. And many of the other, some of the other, not many, some of the other Hasidic leaders were becoming aware of her and, but needed to tread carefully because she was getting, she did have a reputation as a holy person. She hadn't done anything technically wrong. Apparently, she would give a Hasidic discourse at Sudash Lishit, which is the third meal on the Sabbath. And according to some people that were there, she would give it behind a screen, so that, like a mechitza, so that it would be the men on the other side of the mechitza, and she would be delivering the discourse. But her numbers grew, and then one of the significant Hasidic rebbe's, the Maggid of Chernobyl, Actually, she went to see him at one point based on a lot of pressure from her own uh, family and followers. And they, he said, look, I think that you need, to, uh, you need to kind of settle down and stop this. We can't... Um. The, cla- the classic argument. The classic argument. People won't handle this. People, it'll, it'll, it'll break. It'll cause too much. I mean, everybody hears that about some issue. And it makes me, every time I read that in history, I read it again and again and again and again and again. The women are told, or not just women, various other uh, particular concerns of minorities or whoever, they're constantly told, look, don't go down this road because it's going to cause too much trouble. They told her to marry. So she tried to marry, but I don't think the marriage was ever consummated. She was already 40 by then, and uh, she consummated it, and the marriage didn't really last. She realized very soon it wasn't for her. And he told her to desist, and she desisted for a while, but irrepressibly her own nature kept coming back, and her followers kept coming, and uh, eventually, probably in order to 
break that kind of pressure, she made Aliyah and she emigrated to Jerusalem. It's a fascinating thing how even within sometimes the most restrictive conservative cultures, they can accept. They can't accept it mentally, but when it happens, they accept it. I mean, a, a, a little bit on a, on a completely different level, a little bit like that with, you know, say, for example, Margaret Thatcher or Golda Meir, right? Oh, you couldn't have a woman. Oh, one says a woman. Oh, yeah, why would there not be a woman? So sometimes reality has to break through. Unfortunately for the Hasidic movement, because I think it would have been extremely interesting, I did not set a precedent or a trend. She was seriously a one-off. The only woman in the entire 250-year history of the Hasidic movement that has ever got to that point. She made Aliyah, she lived in Jerusalem, and when she was in Jerusalem, she started, what we understand is she was working with Kabbalists there in order to effect the serious Kabbalistic rituals that are designed to bring about the redemption. Interestingly enough, there are certain Kabbalistic rituals designed to bring about the redemption for which you need a man and a woman. And we can only speculate that maybe she participated in some of those uniquely because there were very few women around that would have been at the level Kabbalistically or just in terms of their, their educational consciousness to be able to uh, affect those. So it's an extremely interesting episode, those of you who want to go into her particular history. But the Maid of Ludmere, she's been written about, she's been discussed, but it's kind of like extremely unique in terms of a movement that is generally so conservative. I just will look at the time for a second because I want to see... Um, um, okay. I'm going to talk about this person. Uh, all of these women are extraordinary. But this woman is like extraordinary on crack. And I am going to talk about this person. Some of you will be familiar with this person. And if you're not familiar with this person, you should be. We need to talk about the most probably the most significant Jewish woman in the history of this country. This one. There is, as you already were going, what, Australia? <laughs> now, I've got to tell you this, right? Australia, even Caulfield, wasn't always like this. In fact, you know, you've heard me talk about places in the past, even in the 18th, 17th and 18th centuries, that were our complete boch. You, none of it compares in bochness to what it was like here. Now, let me just tell you about this person, because this is so unique, and her story is so phenomenal. And once again, I have to hold back. I'm only doing headlines. Do you understand? Just so we have an awareness of what we're talking about. This young girl, she's only a teenager, and she's pregnant, and she's living on the streets of London, and her name is Esther Abrahams. I need to talk about Esther Abrahams because some of us don't realize just how significant a figure she is. Now, Esther Abrahams is living on the streets of London and she's pregnant and she's a teenager and she is arrested for stealing some silk lace. And she is sentenced to seven years that may or may not include this new idea that the British government is talking about, transportation and transportation to Botany Bay. So she's in Newgate Jail. When she's in Newgate Jail, she gives birth to a daughter, Rosanna. The daughter is called Rosanna Giuliano because she alleged that the father was this mystical 
Judeo-Portuguese, Sephardic, handsome, twinkle-in-the-eye kind of dude <laughs> called Giuliano. But the father is totally not on the scene. She gives birth to Rosanna. And very soon after, she is placed with her daughter, together with about a thousand other convicts, in the first fleet. In the first fleet. This is not the second fleet, the third fleet, the 15th fleet. This is the first fleet fleet. They don't know what the fleet is going to meet them when they get there. This is her lot. There's, only, there's about six to eight Jewish convicts that we know of on the first fleet, but none of them, obviously, for obvious reasons, as you'll realize when we talk about her, are as well known as Esther Abraham's. Because Esther is on the ship, and while there's several ships, a whole convoy, like 10 or 11 ships in the first fleet. Now, some people don't realize that the first fleet was not, you know, a cruise, <laughs> right, that took a couple of weeks. This was months and months. First of all, they, and they went a really weird way. I don't know if you've ever tracked the first fleet, but they went, they went down to Brazil, and then they come across to the Cape of Good Hope and then they go and can catch the trade winds onto what they hope will be Australia and then come up from the southern end and then find their way to Sydney Cove. I mean, just the fact the first fleet got to where it needed to get to was kind of like a peak of navigational engineering of the 18th century. But nevertheless, it was a long voyage. She's there. You can imagine what's happening to a vulnerable girl with a small child on the first fleet nished good at all but Esther was very very fortunate because through her own I don't even know what the words will be because it, we, we, we know a lot about Esther Abrahams but it, it must have she must have had a remarkable quality about her and intelligence obviously she didn't look too bad uh, but she managed to strike up a friendship with a guy called no, a guy called George Johnston and George Johnston if if you know you could give an entire talk just on George Johnston up to this point he's amazing but George Johnston is kind of like who was uh, been injured in a war in the Americas so he's in the he's in the Royal Navy so they said why don't you go as one of the officer officers on the first fleet so he's an officer he's the lieutenant and he strikes up a friendship with Esther now historians are not sure of the nature of the friendship we know what the nature of the friendship became when they got to New South Wales but on the boat it's difficult to know but what we do know is that as the ship was rounding the Cape of God you'd been at sea for quite a few a couple of months a few months obviously and if you read between the lines, Esther was probably, it would appear, having trouble feeding the baby. She wasn't producing enough milk, whatever, which is not surprising given the rations she probably had to survive on. And Johnston left the boat as it was rounding the Cape of Good Hope. They stopped the fleet for a couple of days to resupply some stuff. And Johnston left the boat and went and bought her, bought her. She's a convict. He's an officer. But they had developed a friendship. He bought, and he also got her to change ships. She, he got her to change ships mid, mid, mid thing, which is amazing, because he said, You can't be on that ship, you've got to be on this ship. Uh, and he went and bought her a goat. So they had a, they had a goat, so they could milk the goat, so they could feed Rosanna. So already there's this bond developing, and it's very smart. It's very smart from Esther's point of view. Whatever she had to do to develop that friendship with Johnston, very smart because that was her protection. No one is going to muck around if you're under the protection of an officer in the first fleet. Remember that the governor and the officers, they were the rulers. It was a convict fleet. Well, <laughs> they arrive famously on the 26th of January 1788. That's the first Jewish people to arrive, whites, 
in white settlement, to arrive in European settlement, to arrive in this country, were there from the very, very beginning. It's not the case of, oh, they set up Australia and then Jews came. Jews were here from the very first day. And after they arrive in Sydney Cove, she, and she kind of serves a bit of her sentence, this is a whole thing, but eventually she and Johnston are living together. Now that is kind of like, might seem scandalous, uh, but at the time, in the settlement, even though the governors didn't like it, they were accepting of the fact that the officers could have companions. Especially amongst women who had served their time or had shown sufficient good behaviour. And the, the, the fact that they didn't get married, well, we'll overlook that. We can understand we're on the other side of the world. This would be like setting up a colony on the moon today. Or Mars. Australia was... So they're living together. And now they're kind of... So, you know, there's a de facto. And they, she, they start having children. And they had quite a number of children. Obviously, Rosanna was, her daughter was their oldest. She actually ended up marrying uh, Isaac Nichols, who was famously the first postmaster of Australia, but that's a whole other thing. George and Esther built a nice big house in a grant that had been given because the officers got some nice bits of land mm -hmm. uh, in where? In Annandale. And they built Annandale House, which was one of the first stately homes in uh, the colony of New South Wales. And they built Annandale House. They probably had a few com more than a few convicts help them build it. And that became their property and so on. And Johnston, by this stage, had decided not to go back to England when his contract with the Navy had finished, but he was going to stay in, in Australia and become part of the New South Wales Officer Corps, the newly established New South Wales Officer Corps, which would obviously give him a prestigious rank within it. So he was already virtually a captain. He was a captain and then almost a major, like he was one of the uh, pillars of that. Their oldest son, George, by the way, was the first Australian-born person ever to enter uh, the Royal Navy. So, the Jewish boy. He wouldn't necessarily have seen himself as a Jewish boy. Now, all of this time, Esther refused to marry George. We can only speculate it's because of the fact that George was not of her faith. She saw herself very much as of her Abrahamic faith. She didn't want to be. She obviously was, there was obviously, obviously a very deep bond between them. And then came the fateful events of the 26th of January, 1808, which of course, as you famously know, was exactly 20 years since First Fleet. And what happened on the 26th of January, 1808? The Rum, Rebellion. the Rum Rebellion. This was the only coup in Australian history, successful military coup. The New South Wales Officer Corps deposed Governor Bly and set up a temporary junta. The history of the Rum, Rum Rebellion, massive, go into it. If you're not aware of it, it's a very important part of Australian history. And who led the Rum Rebellion? George Johnston. And who became Lieutenant Governor when they sent Bly back to Britain? George Johnston. So who was now First Lady of the Colony? Esther Abrahams. Esther Abrahams was the First Lady of the Colony of New South Wales. And so much so that Johnston used to insist that she be referred to as the First Lady. Not bad for a girl from the streets of London. She was now the first lady of the colony. During the time of the Hunter, remember that at, uh, the Hunter didn't last forever. I don't know if you've noticed, like we don't have a Hunter today. It only lasted for a couple of years until basically England went ah, and sent out a new governor who was, of course, Governor Macquarie. Anyway, during the time of the junta, the junta made a number of land grants. Check this out. A number of land grants. So amongst their significant land grants, obviously they made nice grants to Johnston himself and they made grants to Johnston's son George. But a significant land grant was given to Esther. So she's the first woman in Australian history to hold land in her own right. When Macquarie comes out, then Johnston has to sail back to London for a court-martial. 
a huge royal commission into the Brum Rebellion against Bly. Eventually, Johnston gets away with that with a relative slap on the hand. They, they realised that he probably had to do what he had to do, but they didn't want to approve it. So there's all sorts of things. And I think he had to retire from the Navy and so on. But then Johnston stayed in London beyond that court-martial in order to argue the case for the land grants uh, that were made by the Junta to be allowed to stand, and in particular, the grants that were made to his de facto partner, Esther Abrahams. And he stayed in London, I think, for another two years in order to do that, and then eventually came back. And that's probably why, when he came back in 1813, it's in 1814 that we finally find that Esther and George become married. It's an amazing love story. Uh, and then, obviously, with subsequent years, and she is the mother of several important Australian families that descended from her. And then you get all the funny rumours. The rumours, people can't leave Jewish history alone. There is a rumour, which would be amazing if it was true, but doesn't make any sense, that in her later years, throughout the 20s and 30s, she, she passed away in, I think, 1846. She was running a kosher kitchen out of the house in Annandale. I'm going, who's going to slap out to Annandale in the 1830s for a schnitzel? I mean, really, right? But she did express a number of times her identification as, uh, as, as an Israelite, as a Jew, as she gave... Uh, uh, vocal and moral support to the fledgling Jewish communities that were happening but by that stage she was already an older woman and one of the grand madams of the early early settlement of the colony a remarkable woman Esther Abrahams and I think that there has to be more said about her in the context not only of just of Jewish history but of Australian history and uh, Johnston himself amazing figure she's at the core of the first 20 to 30 years of Australian Jewish history. In the, uh, in the break, before the break, and that is, because uh, some of you might be thinking, oh, you're Rachel Varnhagen, oh, obscure. Uh, one of the fascinating things about Rachel Varnhagen, apart from her life, uh, we spoke about her, she really did run the major salon um, was in Berlin, was the fact that there is an asteroid named after her <laughs> called Varnhagen. And that is not, as far as I know, an honour that is shared by many Jews, generally, and certainly, to the extent that I'm aware of, not by any other Jewish woman. There have been two or three Jewish female astronauts. Obviously, the most famous of those I'll probably have to discuss next week, but there are... No one's got an asteroid uh, except Valhagen, uh, who's regarded, therefore, as a very significant historical figure. Now... The, 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 the women, I've, I want to talk now, it's, I, I got to the break, I got here, and uh, I'm now going to talk about women of the 20th century. And here I've had to restrict myself really to discussing four women. If you're going, if you're going to sitting around at that dinner table and they go, who are the most influential, famous, important four women from Jewish history of the 20th century who are you going to go with? And I know there are many others, and I'd even appreciate people telling me, if by the end of the talk I haven't mentioned certain ones, to tell me about them, just to make sure that I can assess and see whether they need to go in next week. The first person I'm going to talk about, I mentioned last week, and really I had to include it when I realised just how much people weren't aware of her uh, last week, when I mentioned her. Uh, two of these women have a very contemporary life because they're born round about the same year. But the first one is, of course, I mentioned her last week. And I don't think I can not discuss her. Just too interesting. And that, of course, is Bertha Pappenheim. Yeah, no, four. Four. We're going with four. Bertha Pappenheim. And how long have I got? About 35 minutes. So that's roughly about eight minutes per person. So let's try and do Bertha Pappenheim in eight minutes, if that would be at all possible. She's born about 1859, 1860s, so we're talking in that vintage, born into a, a nice upper middle class German family. That means that her father was a kind of a 
a merchant, I think her father actually came from a fairly orthodox background. They were merchants and they were well, quite well to do. They had a nice house. They would take uh, summer holidays in places. She was getting a good education and an education in all the right kinds of values as well. You know, the, by the second half of the 19th century, cultured German Jews were seriously cultured and seriously believing in the importance of education for their children. They were not, the Pappenheims were not part of the, uh, the assimilationist movement so much following emancipation. They, they stayed Jewish, they stayed fairly traditional. And then as a teenager, as in her late teens, uh, her father got sick and uh, that was a big shock to her, kind of rocked Bertha's perfect kind of world. And as a result of which, she underwent a series of what we would call psychological episodes. The historical view now is that they're not so sure just how much her condition was psychological or in fact physiological. It may have actually been a form of tuberculosis, which uh, leaves people with hallucinations and so on. But she was, she was very, she had some serious, serious mental health problems. And bearing in mind, this is now, we're now in the, 18, the late 1880s, and so the whole view of mental health then was very different from what it is now. However, certain pioneering medical specialists were seeking out work with the people going through mental health issues because they believed that there was possibly a science that, of mental health that could lead to a cure. And as we know, two of the more famous of those people that were working at the end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century on mental illness to try and work out a science of understanding the mind and why it undergoes uh, mental pressures were, of course, Breuer and Freud. Uh, now, what all historians of uh, psychiatry and uh, psychiatric healing uh, are agreed on is that if there is one fundamental breakthrough case in the history of psychoanalysis, it is regarding a woman called Anna O. It's referred to in the literature as the case of Anna O. And Anna O was worked on for quite a number of years by Breuer. And then he passed on all his notes to Freud. Freud made some very important uh, and not so important insights into uh, Anna O's condition. And this went back and forth. And Anna O became a celebrated case because it was based, it was based primarily on the treatment of Anna O. That the whole foundation of the science uh, of um, which was of psychoanalysis, which was called at that stage. It wasn't called psychoanalysis till later. It was in the very, very early stages, around about when Anna O oh was undergoing this experimental therapy. It was called the talking cure. And this was the very, very first, the very, very first empirical discovery of psychoanalytic theory was the fact that, and they didn't know why, they just noted this as a phenomenon that when people talked about their delusions and their fantasies and, and, and their things, when they talked them out and were able in some way to contextualize them as a consequence of their condition, the symptoms abated. And that was the beginning of psychoanalysis. And Anna O oh was Bertha Pappenheim. So that's the first thing. That does that alone is not what makes her famous and amazing. That just happened. This was, in fact, for many years later, there were people who'd known Bertha Pappenheim for a long time that never realized that she was Anna O. Oh. She herself didn't go around publicizing that. It came out later. And in fact, AO is simply what Breuer and Freud did with the initials of BP. They just moved back one initial from each of those to create Anna O. Oh. Now, so Bertha spent quite a few years in that treatment, so we know a lot about her late teens because her whole life and her thoughts and everything were documented in great detail. So that's the first thing we know about Bertha Pappenheim. But when Bertha, once Bertha had recovered from that and she spent um, quite a bit of time, you know, in, in kind of uh, convalescence and getting herself together, we kind of find her emerging in the late 1890s and early 1900s where she was emerging as someone who was writing 
lecturing and advocating, this is a very short summary of Bertha Pappenheimer, on the rights of women and calling for greater participation of women in Jewish life and even more particularly in the wider society or perhaps even more generally in the wider society. She worked on two very, very interesting translations. She was the first person to translate Mary Wollstonecraft's book, you know, in defense of the rights of women into German. And she also translated into German the memoirs of her own ancestor, Gluckel of Hamelin. And that is why Bertha, for much of her life, took Gluckel as her kind of feminist icon. Not necessarily the person we would necessarily go to first as a feminist icon for us today, but for Bertha, Gluckel had particularly strong resonance. There was a familial connection and she herself had worked on translating Gluckel's memoirs into German from Yiddish. So Bertha emerges as a kind of uh, literary and then she and then she founds, uh, with some other women, she founds an organization in Germany at the time called the Jüdische Frauenbund, which obviously, as the name suggests, was the, an association uh, of Jewish women. And uh, the Jüdische Frauenbund went on to be quite an influential organization, joining up with the general Frauenbund that was happening in Germany at the time to create a network of organizations that would advocate and work for the rights of women. Remember at the very beginning of this course I said there are some women we're going to discuss who are great people and it just so happens that they're a woman, uh, where there are others who are great as women and because they, they push forward constantly uh, the rights and the status of women. Bertha and Papaheim is certainly probably in both categories, but she's certainly uh, in that second category. That is her, what she has given herself over to. Now, what is very significant is that in the early 1900s, she traveled to, this is the early 1900s. This is not last week, right? With the, with a grant from the EU or the Glenara City Council. <laughs> This is the early 1900s. She travels to an international conference that was organized on traffic in women. She became fascinated and compelled to contribute and work towards eliminating traffic in women. This is a problem that is still with us today. This is a problem that is still with us today in ways that many, many Western governments don't want to know about. It's a huge problem, and it was a massive problem then, if you can imagine then, without all of the uh, protections or, or interferences that government might want to do against this type of thing, then it was rampant. She eventually moved near Frankfurt. I'm going to take a small footnote to that. I want to talk for two minutes about a fascinating episode in Jewish history that not many people know about. And I've discussed it before, but now is a very, very good moment to talk about it. Not so much about Bertha Pappenheim, so don't get confused, but it's on the topic of traffic in women and the kind of thing that was happening at that very time. I don't know whether Bertha would have been made aware of this or whether this would have come up at the conference, but we know about this now, certainly. What was happening, and just an example of when we talk about traffic in women, and this plays out as a major point in, in Jewish history of the late 19th, early 20th century, is that what was, I remember last week we discussed, and it kind of dovetails, it segues into what we talked about last week in relation to the Ottoman Empire. So there, are, there was a scam being run. Guys were going to the shtetls in Poland and finding young girls and promising them that if they come to Istanbul with them, they will marry them off to rich Sephardic boys or boys from wealthy Sephardic families. Now, what girl in the shtetl is not going to go with that chance to get out of uh, the shtetl and go and live in a big exotic city where you'd be married off to some wealthy Sephardic boy? And hundreds of these girls were taken from Poland to Istanbul. When they got to Istanbul, the scammers who were running the ring were tried in the first instance to sell them onto the harem, 
Now, the harim might have taken a couple. We talked extensively about the harim last week. But if the harim wasn't interested in them, they got dumped on the streets. And if you're a girl from the shtetl, who only speaks a bit of Yiddish and might know how to milk a cow, and you're dumped on the streets of Istanbul, there's only really one way to survive. And after a while, after a few years, even a, more than a decade of this happening, there were so many of these girls on the streets of Istanbul that they created their own community. They created their own community and they got hold of a building. And in that building on the first floor they made a synagogue. <laughs> Listen, I found this whole thing out when I was in Istanbul. And the building's still there. On the second floor was a restaurant. On the third floor, the girl, for travellers, on the third floor the girls lived. And on the fourth floor was uh, for the older women who were no longer really working or whatever. And this synagogue was only, it wasn't called the synagogue of whores, but it was on the street of the prostitutes. The street of the prostitutes in Istanbul at that time was in the Jewish area. And so they were only allowed to build a synagogue in the street of the prostitutes because that's under Islamic rule, that's what, what we're going to let Jews do. And that building for many, many years was a communal place of residence and worship and hospitality for these hundreds of girls that over quite some time had ended up on the streets of Berlin, oh, not Berlin, Istanbul. A remarkable, remarkable story, but just as a side point to the concept of human traffic. As a result of some of her work in this and her contributions, Bertha set up, it wasn't quite an orphanage, but it was a home and obviously had a lot of children in there, a lot of abandoned children, but the primary purpose of the home of this institution that she set up was to care for what were referred to as fallen or delinquent women either women who had had children out of wedlock had illegitimate children former prostitutes uh, women who'd gone off the rails and whose society had shunned and Bertha opened an institute for them and for and she that institute she ran that institute that institute was run right up until it was closed by the Gestapo in the late oh. 1930s it was an amazing institution interestingly also about Bertha is that she was uh, obviously, by this time, she is one of the major figures in German feminism and in Jewish uh, concerns about women and so on. And so her opinions on things were often highly regarded. And we know about her opinions on things. Obviously, if you're in Germany in the first part of the 20th century and you're in Jewish Germany, one of the big discussions you're going to be having, and German Jewry was divided on this, as it was in many other places, including here, was what is your position on the Zionist question? Is Zionism something that we should be getting involved with, or is Zionism not a good idea? And Bertha was one of those who came out. She was pretty anti-Zionist. She believed that getting people to Israel, and especially young people to Israel, would break up families and so on. And she, all her life, she was devoted to building the concept of the family. And even uh, women and people whose lives she helped recover, she would always guide them ultimately towards the family unit, which she felt philosophically was the safest place for all people to be, assuming that the family is working functionally. But she didn't like Zionism. That changed. That changed once the Nazis came to power. And I mean, she died in 1936. She didn't actually see the Holocaust, but she saw the writing on the wall, so to speak, in terms of suddenly, because she reappraised uh, her opinion of, of Israel. But this is, Bertha Pappenheim is a person not to be underestimated in just how far uh, she advanced concerns about women and the rights of women and the status of women and the dignity of women uh, in modern Western societies as they were emerging in Europe in the early 20th century. So Bertha, I'm putting Bertha there, but a personal kind of hero of mine, a phenomenal woman and someone that I would encourage you to have a look at and someone who we don't speak about enough today. The second woman, and was that eight minutes? I've got no idea if that was eight minutes. No, that was much more than eight minutes. So I have to be very careful. If I've spoken for eight minutes about Bertha, then oi va voi. Uh, the next one's going to be... How can, how can I do this? How can I? I mean, this is a chutzpah. A chutzpah. Even if I was to speak for, for 30 minutes now on this person, it would be a chutzpah. 
next person is amazing. You can't not talk about the three or four most influential and famous and amazing women in Jewish history of the 20th century without talking about Henrietta Zold. And Henrietta Zold, I mean, it's, you know, some women, like we spoke last week, right? Some women are on Donna Grazia level. Every couple of hundred years we produce someone of a Donna Grazia level and that in the 20th century is Henrietta Zold. So Henrietta's born around about 1860, also around about the same time as Bertha. She grows up in Baltimore, uh, where her father is a rabbi. And Henrietta, I think, is the oldest of about eight daughters, and clearly far and above the, the most brilliant of them all and the most eager to become educated. Their father was a shtickle rushy, you know what I mean? He said, well, I have sons, I'll teach my daughters. And Henrietta grew up with the full effort of a kind of the type of education that rabbis would give to their sons was poured into her. So the first thing about Henrietta is that she's an extremely erudite person. And in fact, she's so erudite that she is, scores a job by the 1890s, she is working as the first editor of the JPS, of the Jewish Publication Society, and as a proofreader and editor and a writer. So that's the first kind of incarnation of Henrietta Zoll as a kind of prominent uh, woman scholar editor. She edits, and this is something that I only discovered recently, and when, when you're re uh, reading the introduction to Marcus Jastrow's famous, famous dictionary of the Talmud. I know that many of you don't... Um, necessarily uh, share my uh, almost all-consuming passion with uh, Aramaic, but there is a very important text right throughout the 20th century for the study of Aramaic called Jastrow's Dictionary of the Talmud, and lo and behold, the first person, he thanks Henrietta, Miss Henrietta Zold, uh, this is already, in, it, it was published in 1903, she was the proofreader and editor of Jastrow's Dictionary of the Talmud. It's astonishing. If she just did that, it would be remarkable, but that's not even touching the beginning of what makes Henrietta Zold so incredibly remarkable. And the main points are, is of course, um, in uh, 1912, well, you know, she starts getting... <laughs> She starts getting involved in different kinds of movements. She is a very, very different from Bertha because Henrietta started to really kind of identify with the state of Jews in the land of Israel and the nascent Zionist movement. And that is why in around 1912, she uh, primarily, but also assisted with a group of other women, founded uh, an organization called Hadassah. And the purpose of Hadassah certainly was to try and uh, create institutions on the ground in Palestine, but useful institutions. And amongst the institutions that had us founded, probably the most famous in the beginning, it was this, it was the most famous that Henrietta was personally involved in establishing, was of course a school, the Hadassah School of Nursing. So they produced many nurses. And that project, being involved with health care and producing the whole generation of nurses for the nascent Jewish Palestinian and ultimately Israeli society led on to the establishment of a hospital which became known as Hadassah Hospital and so on. So that is, but everything, every step of the way, it's not like she set up Hadassah in 1912 and then went off and did other things. She was personally instrumental in the initiatives and the building of every single phase of the whole Hadassah project. And of course, Hadassah is now a, a huge international women's movement uh, with hundreds of institutions. They support numerous things right across Israel. And that is Henrietta Zold's huge, huge project. I mean, you've got to realize who we're talking about. Or already, even earlier on, even earlier on, before she became kind of what I talked about, the editor for JPS and so on, before that, in her own neighborhood, she realized, in her own neighborhood in Baltimore, and she saw it in New York and other places, because at the end of the 19th century, millions, literally, of Russian and Eastern European immigrants were coming, in, Jewish, were coming into America. We know those famous pictures of all that happening. 
and they didn't have any skills by which to advance themselves or integrate. So she set up, she set up a concept called an immigrant night school. That concept of the immigrant night school, which she personally taught and she ran for years until it was taken over by the city of Baltimore, once it already had like 5,000 people enrolled in it and they took it over, became the foundational model of the whole of the night school concept in American society. That you can have a job, you can be an immigrant, whatever, but you go to night school and gradually you can work your way up uh, the social uh, educational advancement. That was Henrietta's initiative. So when we, if we zoom forward 30 or 40 years later, when she establishes Youth Aliyah, her entire, that entire thing, Youth Aliyah, that's Henrietta's old as well. And that brought something in the course of the, uh, a few years, that brought something like, third, first of all, we know for sure that Youth Aliyah saved at least, because we know the numbers, 30,000 children that it brought. It was actually founded upon the idea, it's an amazing idea, that let's take kids around about the age of 17 and let's bring them to Palestine for like a leadership year. Eventually that actually transformed once the Nazis came to power and they realized that sending kids back to Germany was a very bad idea. That then transformed into effectively settling them in Israel and that then forms the foundations of what became the Yeshuv movement but let's bring kids Africa. So really, Henrietta Zoll is also in a way responsible for this whole idea that we now take for granted of the Schnat or the year in Israel that happens for kids after school, which was kind of Henrietta's initiative that started Euthelia. But by the time the war is coming along and so on, and the Nazis are in power and Jews are finding it difficult to get out of Europe, Euthelia managed to actually save at least 30,000 children from Europe itself and brought them to Palestine. It's a massive project. Each of these projects for Henrietta Zold alone would be amazing. That's why I sometimes put her in the same category as Donna Grazia, because when you talk about Donna Grazia, each of Donna Grazia's projects alone would have been uh, amazing uh, in themselves. But of course, she was a, a massive advocate of the, uh, of the Zionist cause. She didn't uh, see the state. Uh, she passed away in 1945. She never had any children. She was known as the mother of an entire generation, especially kids who were saved from, you, from the Holocaust, Court referred to her as their mother. In fact, even till today, uh, Mother's Day in Israel is celebrated on Henrietta Zold's birthday, which is the 30th of Shabbat. That is Mother's Day in Israel. So she's just a huge figure and would have to be, without a doubt, in that list. Now, the, the next person I'm going to talk about, but like, once again, I'm sorry, I, I, there's so much more we could say. I'm just looking at the time. Uh, the next person is kind of like an obvious one. And I, I know that many of you are very, very familiar with the life and career of Golda Meir. But I wanted to, uh, I wanted to just touch upon a couple of things to do with Golda that are not always as known. So obviously, first thing we know, first uh, female Prime Minister of Israel. Uh, that's kind of like the height, that's the, the big bullet point. But when we look at Golda's career, uh, it's kind of very single focused. She was a professional politician basically from the moment she was born, worked tirelessly in advance. She was actually born in Russia as Golda Mabovich, but she grew up in Milwaukee, of all places. Uh, married a guy called Meyerson, so she was Golda Meyerson for quite some time, Golda Meyers, and then after the state, then or she changed it to Golda Meir, or towards the state, or whatever. Now, some things, uh, and of course, she was, um, Ben Gurion used to refer to her as the best man in his cabinet, but she was involved at every level of the formation of the state, and so on. Some, just, just a couple of the fascinating things about God that I find personally fascinating, uh, and perhaps a little less known, is uh, that during the uh, months before the declaration of the state, Golda was sent back to the, United, sent to the United States to raise funds. They needed to raise funds because they needed to buy arms. They needed to buy arms primarily from Eastern European arms manufacturers uh, in order to defend what they knew was going to be an attack once they declared the state. I mean, if, uh, a few of us would actually remember, but... I certainly don't. I wasn't around then. But uh, from what we understand, for about five, six months before 
the declaration of the state, there was a kind of a feeling this was going to happen at some point. The UN vote was, you know, coming in the balance and so on. However, they needed arms, so they sent, uh, Ben Gurion sent Golda to America to collect funds, and the estimate was that uh, she would probably be able, this is, this is 1948, so this is our big ton of money, that she would might be able to raise about seven or eight million dollars. And she raised 50 million dollars from American Jews in 1948. That's just off the scale. And just shows you she was an extremely forceful and eloquent speaker and communicator of the needs of the Jewish people with a totally passionate, wholehearted, utter conviction that the state of Israel needed to come into being in the state of Israel was the primary project of the Jewish people, particularly after the Holocaust and particularly now that the Jews needed their own state. On the eve of the declaration, a few days before, and this is also not necessarily known, if you read biographies of Golda, it's very interesting because this is not so known, is that she went on a very, very dangerous journey. Anyone know about this? To Jordan. She disguised herself as an old Arab woman. She was about 50 at the time. She wasn't that old, but she disguised herself as an old Arab woman and traveled through Jordan and met with King Abdullah. And King Abdullah famously said to her, look, I mean, the Jordanians were, you know, very moderate in relation to any of the other uh, Arab countries. But that's why she went there to try and say, look, we're going to declare the state. This is days before the declaration of the state. We're going to declare the state. So we'd like you not to join in the obvious coalition that's going to attack us. And King Abdullah <laughs> said to her, we would actually prefer that you wait. We're not against you doing this. We'd prefer that you wait. And Golda famously said to King Abdullah, We've been waiting for 2,000 years. How much longer do you want us to wait? And that was a, a famous uh, a thing. And then, uh, and then what's also not always known about Golda is that right after the declaration of the state, Ben-Gurion sent her to be Israel's first ambassador to Moscow. And it, what's fascinating about that is that she therefore was the holder of the first ever Israeli passport. The first Israeli passport issued after the creation of the State of Israel was to Golda Meir because she needed it, because she was going, planning to go to Russia to become uh, Israel's first ambassador to Moscow. Now, Golda is not without criticism. There are many, many who are scathingly critical of uh, her administration, uh, especially around the Yom Kippur War. And, uh, but if you read the uh, notes of the commission and you read the findings and you read all the investigation, they absolve Golda because it was a very, 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 very difficult thing. They knew. By the, don't think that by the day before they were, they were aware. But the problem was, and this was confirmed later by Nixon and Kissinger, Israel could not make the first move. If Israel had done a preemptive strike, even with all the forces, and they had, don't forget, I mean, the real incompetence, if you're going to lay it at the blame, was of certain men. But Golda knew that if they made the first move, they would not get a cent in aid from America. Whereas if they withstood the first assault from the Syrians, they are in the Yom Kippur War, and we know just how close Israel came to being defeated in that war because they waited. Uh, therefore, America was prepared to come uh, and provide aid and so on. It would have been very difficult politically if they'd made the first move. These are very, very tense. But these are decisions that leaders can only make if they're as tough as iron and if you've got... I mean, she is, she's almost like Israel's Churchill. And, and of course, not to mention uh, she was the Prime Minister during the Munich Massacre uh, at the Olympics and set about the whole story that emerged from that with the Mossad and so on. Golda has got a very, very complex political career. But just while we're on Golda, one of my favourite uh, and perhaps most telling and summarising quotes of hers I don't know if any of you have seen it. If you haven't seen it, go and look at it. There's an interview they did with uh, the former Vice President Joe Biden. And Biden's recalling when he was a young senator in the early 70s, around about the Yom Kippur War. He was only about, Biden got into the Senate very young. He was only about 30 years old. And yet he was already a senator. But he went to Israel and spoke with 
Golda Meir. And she was explaining to him the incredibly dire situation that Israel was in in relation to their enemies. She was with maps and she was showing him and so on. He recalls all this. And he said he must have been looking very, very worried. And she said, you look very worried. And he said, well, look what, what you've just shown me, right? And she said, yes, she said. But, Senator, we have a secret weapon. This is classic Golda. If you understand this, this is Golda. And Biden goes, you do? What is it? And she said, we have nowhere else to go. <laughs> that is Golda Meir. We have nowhere else to go. And therefore, we don't have a choice between being victorious or failing. There's only one thing we're going to be. We are going to survive and we're going to be victorious. That is the, the absolute conviction that Golda Meir took throughout all her life. And that characterises really uh, the concept of the, uh, of, of the Israeli uh, Prime Minister since then. So Golda is a very, very important selection in that, in that thing. And then, and there's, uh, I mean, I don't need to tell you there's a lot more we could say about Golda Meir. Since we're talking about the status of women and the reaction to women, I don't know if you know this, but in the mid-50s, uh, Ben-Gurion convinced Golda, for whatever reason, that it would be a good idea if she ran for the position of mayor of Tel Aviv. Do you know this? And uh, she was furious with Ben-Gurion for years after this. Why? Well, uh, she lost by two votes. <laughs> And primarily because uh, in those days it wasn't a general plebiscite. It was the council that elected the mayor. And uh, she didn't want to do it. And Ben-Gurion said, no, no, we need someone so strong in Tel Aviv. So uh, he convinced her. But she lost by two votes. And those two votes were withheld from her by the religious bloc on the council who believed that the mayor should not be a woman. Oh. And so oh. tremendous karma for them that some years later she actually became Prime Minister after Levi Eshkol. Yeah. <laughs> but she was furious about that. And uh, it just shows that once again, you know, people, conservatives and reactionaries to social developments about women, you know, they all clutch themselves at the time, but eventually these things do become reality. Now, the next, uh, I do have one minute and I, 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 I probably have four women that I was going to talk about today. If I don't talk about this woman now, it's, I'm going to have to leave it till next week and we won't, uh, I'll run out of time. So let me just spend two, three minutes on this because you may as well leave here angry. <laughs> and because this, this particular is a choice of mine and I realise that there might be some people that were a little bit irked by this. <laughs> Obviously I'm about to tell you, but before I tell you, I need to preface that. It's controversial. This woman is born in 1906. And she is born into a very intellectual, cultured family in Germany, like, like they all are. Don't forget, German Jews created this world. And in the 1920, she goes to study, you already know who I'm talking about, she goes to study philosophy. And her name is Hannah Arendt. Now, just to tell you how controversial she is, Hannah Arendt's writings were not translated into Hebrew until the 21st century. People didn't want to know about Hannah Arendt. She did certain things in her life and said certain statements in her life that pissed a lot of people off. But I think she's really, really important. And she's coming back in importance. And I want to spend a minute explaining why. First of all, one of her first writings, just so you know what her personal issues were in relation to her own Jewish identity, who, of everybody that we've looked at, and in fact they're on the board today, who did she write a biography on? Rachel Van Hagen. For her, for Hannah Arendt, Rachel Van Hagen was an icon of the struggle with Jewish identity. When she was at university studying philosophy, she met a dude called Martin Heidegger. Heidegger is... Heidegger is the biggest... Well, uh, 
very, very strong claim to be biggest philosopher of the 20th, of the 20th century. Heidegger is massive. She had a huge affair with Heidegger. And I mean affair. If Heidegger famously had affairs. He was married, but he had affairs with uh, two women, both of whom were Jewish. One was Hannah Arendt. And then, and then the big turning point in her relationship with Heidegger happened when the Nazis came to power. Heidegger was appointed uh, the rector of Freiburg University and at his inaugural address he told them, the students, that the best thing you can do to yourselves right now would be to join the Hitler Youth. The Führer is the political leader of Germany. I am its spiritual shepherd. And he remained in that position and remained as the self-appointed spiritual philosophical guide of the German people right throughout the Shoah. Heidegger never himself obviously poured a can of Zyklon B in a gas chamber, but he remained in correspondence with Hitler and never overly talked about the genocide of the Jews, but regarded himself as understanding the true spiritual direction of the German people. Heidegger never apologized after the war for his associations with the Nazi party. Hannah Arendt famously renewed her friendship with him, didn't carry on the affair, but defended Heidegger in a number of uh, articles and so on. And that itself, of course, drew a lot of ire. Heidegger is an amazing thinker, huge investigation of the concept of being and so on, but for Jews, He's uh, always problematic and a shtickle trafe because he, uh, of his alliance with, with the Nazis during the war. But nevertheless, very, very few short years after that, I mean, uh, you got to understand, oh. Hannah herself went, got out of Germany with her husband and they went to uh, Paris. And in Paris, she actually headed up the Paris section of Youth Aliyah. There's a kind of a tie-in there with Henrietta Zold. So when she was in Paris, Hannah was working with the Jewish Agency, with Youth Aliyah, helping kids and so on. So there was a, she, she, a, a very, very proactive, positive side to Hannah. I mean, sometimes we get clouded by some of her more controversial issues, but she did throw herself into that project. And then when the Nazis were moved, the Germans were moving into the north of France, Hannah found herself she was on the run. Famously, she was with Walter Benjamin when Walter Benjamin committed suicide at the Spanish border uh, as they were on the run. She was part of that party that had got visas to go to the United States via Portugal. She writes about that moment uh, very poignantly for those who are familiar with that particular history. Uh, by already 1951, and I know I have to finish, give me 30 more seconds because it's so important. By uh, 1950, she had produced what is probably her most famous book, and this is what I need to mention. Hannah Arendt's most famous book, and probably her most important intellectual contribution, is her work on the origins of totalitarianism. She was amongst the first to identify the fundamental features of humanitarianism and to point out that communism and fascism were both manifestations of the same thing. And they are both characterized by anti-Semitism. And one of the strongest and most fundamental arguments in the origin of totalitarianism is the idea that why does totalitarianism happen? Totalitarianism happens because of the conflict between universal rights, universal human rights, and the sovereign rights of nation states. There is a conflict that happens there. And which type of person is that conflict most acutely expressed about? Refugees. Because the rights of refugees are human rights. And yet countries go, we can't acknowledge those human rights universal human rights because we have our own particular national sovereign rights where we need to protect 
our nations. And it is that conflict, it is in that conflict that the seeds of totalitarianism are born. And that totalitarianism is not simply another political movement, it is an attempt to quash everything in the name of a particular ideology. Now, thing is, in 19, famously in 1960-61, she was uh, commissioned by the New Yorker magazine to cover the Eichmann trial. Those, uh, those, I don't think there'd be anyone in the room that wouldn't be familiar with the Eichmann trial. Um, and uh, that it is that, and that review pissed a lot of people off. But in the course of annoying a lot of people, she did come up with this incredible insight that she coined the banality of evil. That expression, the banality of evil, belongs to Hannah Arendt. She identified it. She couldn't believe that this schmagob, Eichmann, this absolute garnish nobody kind of mediocre public servant was the guy that ran the whole of the Shoah, or the whole of the extermination and the final solution of the Nazis. And, and, and she said, it's so banal. And that has become a kind of like a, a concept. It's a very hard concept to refute. And there's something in it. But it was the way that she actually, in the course of her coverage of the Eichmann trial, she implied that in many ways, uh, the leadership of European Jewry had failed the Jewish people at that time. And she was also asking questions about sometimes. And you know what? The questions, the questions are not so awful and, and ridiculous. Like, why was there such little resistance on behalf of Jews? And obviously, uh, the, those questions, whilst they might be interesting questions, they, they're not uh, particularly sensitive questions only 15 years after the Holocaust and uh, when you're there sent to cover the Eichmann trial. But nevertheless, nevertheless, she was also the first ever female lecturer at Princeton. She held massively important uh, academic titles. Very, very important person, Hannah Arendt, and I think coming back into vogue. I have to wind up here. Thank you for allowing me to could do one more thing because there is a huge topic, a 21st century topic, that I want to cover in some detail with the personalities involved as of now. And we're going to do that next week, along with those of you who are sitting there going, oh, how could he not talk about Hannah Senesch? How could he not talk about, how can he not talk about the poet Rachel? How can he not talk about Judith Resnick? How can he not talk about a gazillion other women? Uh, we'll do that next week. So thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the talk. For episode notes and transcripts, or to learn more about David's next classes and projects, visit davidsolomon.online. You can also find David on Instagram or Facebook. Thank you. We hope to see you again soon. Bye.